Um, so let's move down to uh, Greenland. Um, it's already clear this result just came out uh, this year and it's showing that Greenland is beginning to shed uh, ice faster. It's in a full-blown uh, ice albedo feedback and remember in this phase the ice albedo feedback can go very fast. You can have abrupt changes. Okay. Uh, there are many complicated processes that also amplify this. For example, the glacier is very thick, a couple of kilometers, let's say. The melting starts on top and forms a little puddle where locally the albedo is greatly reduced because it's water, dark water. Uh, that begins to absorb energy and that begins to grow in size and it begins to carve into the glacier and I'll show in a minute how that looks. So in the 1990s you had an average of uh, 1992 to 2002 you had an average of 7 billion tons of shedding uh, per year but by 2002 the estimate is that there is uh, by 2004 to 7 the average shedding has jumped to 177 billion tons per year in just a few years it has gone from an average of 7 billion tons per, uh, per year to 177 billion tons per year. If that's not uh, scary, if that's not convincing enough that it's heading towards this rapid positive ice albedo feedback into deglaciation, you can look at lots of satellite data that are measuring ice concentration, ice thickness, ice elevation and uh, melting rates. Okay, Here is uh, an example of how top of the uh, iceberg uh, of the, the glacier melts and creates a pond. Much lower albedo here than on snow and glacier. You can see a scientist standing there uh, really really sad. There is lots of people that grow uh, go every year uh, uh, to Greenland to do a lot of work. Very brave scientists do incredible work and, and tolerate all these uh, temperature changes and it's heartbreaking, right? So the pond begins to grow and it begins to drill into the glacier and can go all the way to the bottom. It's called a moulin, M-O-U-L-I-N, a French word. Um, so moulins can go all the way to the bottom of the glacier. What's the problem with that? At the bottom already there is friction between the glacier and the bedrock. Remember that the glacier moves, glacier flows like molasses. So there's friction and if the moulin goes down and starts to inject more warm water because water is obviously warmer than the glacier, it begins to act as a lubricant and accelerates the slipping of the glaciers. Okay, just imagine the, the processes that we need to understand. Okay, so the ocean warming around it uh, uh, matters. Uh, these processes of formation of ponds and moulins matter. And here is a good time to mention again the movie Day After Tomorrow. I don't know if you've so, uh, seen it, but uh, actually paleoclimate scientists like Jonathan Overpeck from Arizona uh, had been uh, consulted for it and it has some realistic feedback loops in it. What happens? Um, in the very beginning of the movie somebody is reporting that they are detecting ocean temperatures warmer than normal by 14 degrees centigrade off of Greenland and before you know it the hero and the heroine and the, f the father is the scientist they're having a conflict because New York City is freezing, New York Library is full of ice and so on. How can this happen? Obviously, if glacier, uh, if the ocean gets very warm, starts accelerating the glacier melt, that melt water is eventually going to come into the Gin Seas and the Labrador Sea, where we have deep water formation for which the warm transport of water in the Gulf Stream is important and the heat loss to the atmosphere is important to create evaporation salinity uh, increase and density increase, right? If you begin to put caps of fresh water on top, you are going to weaken this uh, deep water formation, 
hence you are going to need less heat coming in to replace the water that's sinking. So think about the mass continuity. If the water is sinking, water around it is going to converge in to replace the water that's sinking and that water is bringing in the heat. If you reduce the sinking, then you are going to reduce the convergence and uh, the uh, heating. So fresh water is going to make it difficult for the evaporation to create uh, dense waters. Uh, such a thing has happened. When we looked at the Holocene temperatures, I pointed out that around 8250 years there was a, some rapid cooling and it turns out that the glacier melt of the last glacier, uh, ice age that was happening had created huge ponds in Lake Agassiz and there was an ice bridge because the ice didn't, the glacier wasn't melting uniformly and suddenly that ice bridge collapsed and released massive amounts of fresh water uh, onto the, uh, into the North Atlantic where Labrador Sea, where deep water formation was happening. So suddenly there was a hiccup in the global conveyor belt and the warming of the deglaciation suddenly reversed a little bit. So these are real processes. Okay, we're not joking around. These are real things that happen. So if Greenland continues to accelerate in its glacier loss, then soon we could re uh, reach a point of no return. That means the albedo would drop so much, that so much energy is being absorbed that the melting will continue to accelerate and massive chunks of Greenland ice would be, uh, Greenland glacier would be lost. Sea level rise, of course, plus as I mentioned in one of the podcasts before, the mass of the glacier is creating a gravitational pull of the ocean waters around it. When it melts, that glacier, the gravitational pull is reduced, so water sloshes back, and that is partly responsible for uh, the sea level rise from North Carolina to Massachusetts, uh, which is accelerating. The sea level rise is accelerating, so sea level is rising, but at a faster and faster rate three to four times than the global average. Global average is around, let's say, three millimeters per year. This one is going to be around 10 millimeters per year. That's not good news, okay? So all these things we have to worry about. That's the Greenland story.